Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hey, this is us. We're fabulous duo. I'm Michelle. This is Kristen. Uh-huh. And this week we got two new stories, as we do every week. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> so this week is going to be a fun one because I have COVID. So if my voice messes up at all uh, while I'm reading, instead of being like, oh no, you suck, be like, oh no, you're sick, and then keep listening. Cool? So that's going to happen. Yeah, this is a long one, too. My, the one I wrote this week. Yeah. Yeah. I Mine could have been longer, but I was like, this is going to become a novella. No, just an actual novel. Like a real novel. Like it was going to become a publicized series. It was a trilogy. It was called Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to get started here. Um, yeah. Just want to let everybody know that we are on Spotify and Google Podcasts. And um, we also have the page up on our website fabulousduo.podbean.com where you can reach out to us and like comment or like send us like emails and stuff with your anything anything that you guys want to talk to us about or recommend to us or anything um we're also available on listen notes so if you do head over to fabulousduo.podbean.com you can see we have a listen on section and we have all of the uh, buttons available that'll redirect you to the platform you prefer I don't even know what that is. I just know we're on Spotify and something about Google. And I'm like, yes. 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 Okay, so should we go ahead and start? Yeah. So. No. Go home. Is, is that me, Jesus? No. no. So the prompt that I gave Michelle last week is that a genie tricks somebody into swapping places with them Ooh, you know genies can be very tricky so be specific with your wishes but um yeah michelle's story is called asha a beautiful skyline bordered by old shops and temples with a background of mountains and the sound of a bell tolling during the sunset This is what he became accustomed to since he left home. He loved old buildings. Whenever he walked by one, he could tell that it housed many stories from a time long before he existed, and that fascinated him more than any treasure that could be found. He was an archaeologist of sorts, not a real one with education or anything, but he knew about old things and loved to go searching for them in old places. Whenever he discovered a building he'd never seen before, That's where he'd be on his next day off, happily covered in dust and cobwebs, trying to learn all the secrets he could from every object he found. It was Saturday, a day off for him. He was heading out to a house he had seen on his way to work during the week on top of a hill that was quite a ways away from his home. He would often leave for work hours earlier than he needed to, just so he would have time to wander around the city. This usually led him into other neighborhoods and also made him late for work. This house was peculiar in a way that he couldn't describe. It was as if it was calling to him from halfway across the city. The day he found it, he felt like he was in a trance. And of course, by the time he realized where he is, he was already late for work. Today, he gladly made the trip back to it to check it out. The house didn't have the same old-timey charm that the others did. He could see that the architecture was different from most of the other buildings in the city. It was abandoned and falling apart. As he wasn't technically a professional, he didn't have to abide by all their rules. Any other archaeologist type person would have deemed this building too dangerous to explore, seeing as some of the roof was already caved in. He would have left too, if it wasn't for that nagging urge to go in and look around. Checking his watch, he figured that he'd only explore for an hour or two whether he could get in or not. 
the watch he wore was a new model that had stopwatch feature as well. He decided to set the watch for two hours instead of one. Checking his watch, he figured that he'd only explore for an hour or two whether he could get in or not. The watch he wore was a new model that had a stopwatch feature as well. He decided to set the watch for two hours instead of one. Since he came all the way out here, he may as well make the most of it. He always abided by the timer on his watch so as to not lose himself in his thoughts. The roof was partially caved in on top of the front entrance, so he had to circle around to find a way in. The building was more of a mansion than anything. It was also strangely way bigger than it looked from the front. It took longer than he would have thought to even reach a corner of the house, almost as if it was stretching farther away from him as he was walking towards it. Once he finally rounded the corner, he saw the normal overgrown garden and random garbage scattered everywhere that he would see in the backyards of really old places. It seemed like the locals would come here to drink around a fire. Even though there was evidence that people tend to hang out here, it seemed like they never even tried to enter the house, as none of the windows were broken and all the three doors were securely fastened to their hinges. He walked back around to the front of the house where it looked much smaller, and he stood there with his arms crossed, cupping his chin with his hand, just thinking about how to get in. He never damaged anything whenever he went searching houses. He didn't like breaking windows or doors because he respected old things and their innate ability to stay intact for as long as they had without any interference. And it would have been a shame to mess that up. Standing there, he began to consider just leaving and going to one of the other abandoned buildings on his roster. It was clearly too dangerous to go in, and it didn't even seem possible without breaking something. But again, he was compelled to stay there and keep trying. In the few years he had been doing this, he had never come across a building that he couldn't enter. He was proud of that, considering it was a testament to his resourcefulness. Again, he began circling the house and arrived at the backyard. There was no fence, as there weren't any neighbors around, just fields of flowers leading into a forest in the distance. It was clear to him why the local youths hung out here. It was very isolated and quiet. The scent of the flowers surrounding the house filled the air every time a light breeze blew. Being at the top of a hill, meant that there was often a light breeze. He was letting his senses drink in the scenery surrounding him, just staring at the wide open space. Colors of the flowers almost blinding, reflecting the bright sun. Another light breeze began to blow by, but somehow turned into a strong gust, knocking something over to the floor, making a loud metallic crashing sound startling him. He whipped around to see what had happened and walked towards the source of the sound. There on the ground was a large metal ladder. Where was that the whole time? He wondered out loud to himself. He hadn't seen it earlier when he was circling the house. Had it been on the roof? How could the wind blow down a metal ladder? He shook the questions from his mind. Whatever the case was, it looked like he finally had a way in without breaking anything. He propped the ladder up on the side of the house, making sure it was sturdy. He adjusted the straps of his side bag and began climbing the ladder. Again, the house was much higher than he had thought, and the roof seemed like it was stretching further and further away from him as he climbed. Almost as if the whole thing was a mirage created by the hot weather. Finally, he reached the top of the ladder and hoisted himself onto the roof of the house, making sure that the part of the roof that hadn't caved in could still hold him up. Slowly and carefully, he inched himself over to the caved-in side of the roof, knocking over debris as he slid his feet forward. The roof here was weak, 
And again, he found himself thinking that this was a bad idea. But he was already so close, so he kept going. As he got closer and closer to the opening on the other side, the roof gave way to his weight. And with a loud cracking sound, he fell through the roof. He fell long enough to wonder how he was still falling. Like the floor itself was running from him until it wasn't. He expected a concussion, a few broken ribs. He expected that if he even got out of here, he would be in the hospital for some time. Or he expected death. There were so many warning signs. His own brain was telling him not to go in. He didn't even clearly remember how he found the house in the first place. And now he may never get to explore anything again. The racing thoughts and his screams combined together distracted him from the fact that he wasn't falling anymore. His screaming only stopped when he was greeted by laughter echoing off the walls that his screams had been echoing off a moment ago. It was the melodic laughter of a girl, soft and dainty. He opened his eyes and quickly wiped the tears from them. As he tried to regain his footing and composure, he realized that there was nothing under his feet. He hadn't landed. He had just stopped falling. Floating in midair, he began to panic again. He was trying to maneuver himself to see where the sound was coming from. The house was dark. All he could see was the floor, still a few feet below him. The only light inside coming through the hole he had just broken through. He was suspended in air, surrounded by light, making it even harder to see anything. He was twisting and desperately flailing his arms, trying to get control of anything. His thoughts, his feet, the rest of him. The laughter started up again, right next to his ear. You're funny, she chimed. His head snapped to his left to see a girl floating next to him. Somehow, she wasn't just floating. She had glowing copper skin and long black hair that flowed like water all around her, framing her existence. Kind of like the whole house, she felt like a mirage, with her form seeming to shift and stretch like she was just created from the air itself. The wisdom in her eyes seemed misplaced in the playful expression that she wore. Her face was inches from his now, and she pursed her lips and blew smoke in his face. Startled, he reeled backwards, coughing. Next thing he knew, his feet were touching the ground, but he crumpled to the floor as his knees weren't ready to do their job yet. Another enchanting laugh rang out in the darkness. Looking up, he saw her float down and land gracefully beside him, offering her hand for him to get up. It's been a long time since I've been able to talk to anyone, she said as he took her hand. He was absolutely baffled by what had just happened. He had so many questions. How was he floating? How long had she been here? Was this her house? How was she floating? But all he said was, thanks. Holding his hand, she led him deeper into the house, out of the beam of light. It didn't take long for his eyes to adjust to the darkness, as he was used to old houses. I'm sorry that you had to come here, but I'm still excited to meet you, she chattered excitedly. What's your name? she asked, letting go of his hand. He answered absentmindedly, looking around the room she had led him to. Farid. They were in what looked like the sitting room of a mansion. There were a couple couches, all circling a coffee table. Welcome to my home, Farid. Would you like some tea? She asked. Again, not paying any attention, he walked over to inspect the knickknacks on the shelves, coated in a thick layer of dust. Sure. He mumbled. You can take a seat if you like, she called to him before she left the room. It was surreal to be in a house this dark and crumbling being offered tea. 
he found comfort in old things. Maybe that was why he wanted to occupy his own mind with them rather than reflect on the situation he was in. Recalling that his life was just saved by a floating, glowing girl whose legs disappeared from time to time. Just then, the elephant figurine that he had been holding floated out of his hands and back on the shelf. He stared at it, frozen. In his stupor, his feet weren't touching the floor anymore and he was floated over to a couch and dropped into it. Dust and smoke rose up, making him cough and gag. Sit, come talk with me, the tea is ready. Her voice rang out from behind him, accompanied by a light breeze blowing away the dust, allowing him to breathe again. She floated next to him, handing him his tea. The porcelain teacup was white, with bright flowers painted all over it and golden accents on the rim and handle. It was in perfect condition, as if it was brand new. She floated over to the other side of the coffee table without legs leaving a trail of colorful aura as she moved and sat herself in the chair across from him. As she sat, two legs appeared out of the smoke aura below her waist and she crossed them over each other as if they had been there the whole time. He sipped his tea and he could feel her eyes on him, waiting for him to say something. He knew that if he didn't restrain himself, he would only bombard her with question after question. So with the utmost control, he cleared his throat. <clears throat> Do you usually have legs or... He asked as she began to drink her tea and she sputtered and choked at the question. Laughing, she answered truthfully, I don't need legs, but I feel very comfortable with them. Couldn't you have waited until I finished drinking to ask something so absurd? With that melodic laugh, she flicked her wrist and pulled a folded napkin from the table in front of them, wiping her nose in tears. He couldn't help but also let out a chuckle. Sorry, he responded. Okay, now it's my turn to ask you a question, she sniffled. He didn't realize that they were playing this game but it was probably better this way because otherwise he wouldn't stop talking. What year is it? He was taken aback by the question. Why wouldn't she know the year? It's 1980, he answered. At that, she leaned back in her chair with a look on her face that he couldn't understand. Her dark hair ever flowing all around her. the smile on her face and excitement in her eyes fading. But she shook herself out of whatever mood had just possessed her and drank her tea. Your turn! She seemed to be back to normal. He thought for a long time. He had many questions. And he wanted to pick the best ones first, but also didn't want to offend her. He sat there with his hand cupping his chin, thinking hard about how best to use this question when he felt a light breeze cooling his face along with the smell of the flowers from outside. He looked up at her to see her with her head propped up on her arm waiting for him to say something blowing wind in his direction. She smiled when his eyes met hers and somehow she seemed to glow even more to him. Finally, he blurted out, what are you? The breeze stopped and her expression turned mocking. That's a little rude, don't you think? Now, I understand why you take so long to think before you speak, she laughed. His hands flew up to his mouth, shocked at his own words. Before he could say any kind of apology, she held up her hand. I'm kidding, she giggled. I'm a genie. His eyes widened. Genies don't exist, he exclaimed to the glowing, floating girl in front of him with no legs. Oh, well, I guess I should take your word for it on this one, he caught himself. Does that mean you can grant wishes? Hey, 
It's not your turn, she scolded. But yes, that would mean that. But I am only able to grant one wish. Can I wish for a map of the world with the oldest structures that can teleport me wherever I choose? He asked, leaning forward. She laughed again. You really like old things, huh? Technically, yes, but then I wish for a map of the world that can teleport me to the oldest structures on the planet. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> Technically, yes, she continued, but I wouldn't be able to grant it since I'm a cursed genie. Immediately, he was flooded by guilt. Cursed? He asked, looking for clarification. It's not your turn, she said quietly. Since you got three questions in a row, I have a request. Don't make any other wishes or ask about the curse. Her expression was serious now. That's two requests, he said. She blinked at him for a second and her smile returned. You have complaints? She asked. Of course I do. It makes sense to get one request from three questions, not two. He started leaning back with his arms crossed. Well then, I request that you don't make any other wishes and... She paused for a second and dropped her gaze. I ask that you don't ask me about the curse. Still staring at the ground, she added quietly, as a friend. Silence hung in the air. He wasn't going to ask her about the curse, since she so clearly didn't want him to. He had said that more of a joke, but looking at her with her hands clasped tight in her lap, and her cheerful stare now avoiding him, he'd consider himself a monster if he didn't change the subject. Do you like tea? He asked lightheartedly. She snorted. <laughs> Do you like wasting your questions? Oh! Her hand flew up to her lips. I just wasted mine! In that dark, dusty room, they sat there and laughed together among the faint smell of flowers. She told him about how genies work and explained that instead of a lamp, she was confined in the mansion and it didn't need rubbing. She showed him around while he was telling her about the newest inventions in the human world. Things like computers, spaceships, medical advancements. He felt like he could stay there forever. The one thing that bothered him, though, was that she refused to answer some of his questions. She wouldn't explain what she meant by being able to grant only one wish or tell him if she had a genie boyfriend. But to make it fair, she decided to grant him a request instead. Almost like they were playing truth or dare. He usually asked her to do something fantastical with her genie powers because he never got tired of seeing the enjoyment in her eyes at getting to show off to somebody. They continued this way for a while longer until it was her turn again and her expression shifted into something of worry. Her eyebrows knitting together as if something had just dawned on her. Farid, how long have you been here? She said, looking over to him. She was staring at him intently, as if she was searching his eyes for something as well. Her long hair flowing in between them and the smell of flowers intoxicating him. How long have you been here? He asked. I'm going to pass on that one. Now answer mine. Do you know how long you've been here? I have no way to track time, she explained. He checked his watch. It seemed to have stopped moving since he had gotten to the house, displaying the same time it had the last time he checked it. It looks like my watch stopped working, he said nonchalantly. She grabbed his wrist and looked at the watch. Her head snapped up in horror, looking into his eyes. She asked, You only notice this now? Her hands were cold around his wrist, and he found the way she was looking up at him to be strangely endearing. 
As if in reaction to that thought, she muttered, We're out of time. She began pulling him by the wrist, ushering him back to the hole in the roof. You have to leave, she said hurriedly. But you still owe me a request, he protested. There's no time for that. Let me stay here with you, he interrupted her. Not missing a beat or even looking in his direction, she simply answered, No. His face flushed at the rejection. Hey, you broke a rule, he said, still being ushered toward the exit. I never should have kept you in here. I should have sent you back as soon as the house let you in, she said, half mumbling to herself, half expressing her guilt to him. But that all flew over his head. Still offended by the fact that she broke a rule, he said, well, since we are breaking rules, with a deep breath, he continued, I wish I could... Suddenly, there was a potato in his mouth, and he was standing on the grass in the sunset. He blinked, and the alarm on his watch started going off. Turning it off, he whipped around to see the house still there, and in the window was that ever-flowing black hair and those wise eyes that were filled with sadness. He threw himself at the window and banged on the glass. I wish to stay here with you, he shouted. She let out a laugh that he couldn't hear and pointed to her ear, shaking her head. They couldn't hear each other anymore. She left the window briefly and returned with a notebook. I told you not to wish for anything, Farid. The curse almost got you, she wrote. He stared at the message. He had forgotten that she had mentioned a curse at all. Then, he frantically started searching his bag for his notebook. When he found it, he asked her to explain the curse. Just then, the house started stretching and destabilizing, as if the mirage was leaving with the sun. She took some time to write something down, then held it out for him to read. Now that you are out of the house, I can tell you everything you want to know with the time that we have. I can only grant one wish, one specific wish. If you wish to stay here in any form, I am obligated to grant the wish. However, there can only be one of us residing in the house at a time. As a result, you would have been trapped here alone. The genies in this house all wish to be free, and so for hundreds or maybe even thousands of years, they would let the house lure people in, in order to switch with them. The house uses any means necessary to convince someone to stay. I thought that if I didn't have the desire to be free, you would be safe. But I started to see it in your eyes, the same way I saw it in mine all those years ago, and the person before that saw it in theirs. Infatuation. He was able to completely see through the house now. They were out of time, and he still had so many questions. She began writing again and held up the notebook. This is goodbye. Thank you for talking with me. I hope you didn't lose too much time in here. She gave him one last cheerful smile, and he could feel a pressure in his chest that he had never felt before. There was one more thing he had to know. He quickly wrote the question and showed it to her through the window. At this point, all he could make out from the mirage was her face. There wasn't enough time to write the answer to the question, so she clearly and slowly mouthed the word, Asha. And the house was gone. The sun had set, and he was left standing in front of some broken down hut in the moonlight. She shared her name with the name of his city, which was named after a missing girl over 100 years ago. Her name was Asha. Wow, look at that. What you think of that? I thought she was gonna like, give him all the sob story and then he'd feel bad and be like, I don't care, you deserve to be free. Swap places with me. And then she'd be like, are you sure? Is this what you want? 
And then afterwards, like, you know, when he's inside the house and she's outside, she'd be smirking and laughing and he'd be like, wait, what? That's what the house wants you to do. Yeah, pretty much. But she's sweet. Asha cute. She yeah. nice. Yeah. But yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. That went in a different direction than I expected it to, which is good. Because I never it like it when the story is what you expect it to be, and it, so far it never has been. So, <laughs> you know. Because, I mean, what's the point of, like, going through a story when you're just like, oh, this this should or would or could happen, and then being like, oh, look, it did. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, what was your favorite part? Um, My favorite part would have to be... Probably when she pulled, like, when she used her magic to, like, put things back and pull them to the chair. She's like, I said sit for tea. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to make him, like, well, like, that part where he was, like, not paying attention to her because he was, like, I guess kind of trying to cope with the, he was like, ah, this is so fucking weird. I'm trying to, like, disassociate. And yeah. she's like, all right, just put yourself in the chair and drink the tea. Drink the tea and shut up. <laughs> yeah, drink it. Chamomile. Yeah. Calms your thoughts. Yeah, so, yeah. I was, like, I, I really didn't know how exactly to do it. Like, I wanted it... I was thinking, like, do I want it to be, like, the genie will successfully trick somebody and then kind of, like, take it back because they feel, feel guilty? But then, like, as I was writing it, <laughs> she kind of just created herself. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, so I'm just gonna... Have company for tea, and that's it. That's my story arc. <laughs> right. So the genie got you. The house got you, Mash. The house is just like, go ahead. And she's like, I'm stronger than the house. Give me tea. Yeah. Like, it's supposed to be that all the other genies before her would be constantly, like, tricking people into replacing exactly. her. Exactly. But she was, she's basically just trying not to do that. Yeah, she's broken the cycle, or hoping to keep the cycle broken. Exactly. So that's that's what I was trying to go for without actually saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it was good. And I really thought that, like, you know, him and the genie would just end up being living there in the mansion together. And um, that would just be, like, their thing going on. Well, you know how it goes. You can't have happy endings. Everything else is a happy ending yeah. in itself because you didn't get... It is a happy ending in and of itself, because now his previous questions is saying things like, oh, what'll happen if I um, if I died here? I can't explore more old houses. But now I'm wondering what if his future obsession is finding more houses like this that lure him in. Um, that's going to be unfortunate for him. I mean, the thing is, when you have something that you love to do, you're going to do it regardless of the consequences. Well, what I mean is, what if he tries to find that house that pulls him in to find another genie or find her again? What if he goes looking for her? I mean, he probably will, but, uh, you know, what are the chances he's going to actually find her? I don't know, seven? What are the chances that something like that's going to happen again? Four. Yeah, so that's why he looks. He's like, is it four or is it seven? Right? <laughs> Speaking of happy endings, are you ready for my story? Your story has a happy ending? Are you ready for my story? I knew it didn't have an happy ending and it happened in... It has to have a happy ending. You can't, can't give me my nightmare and not let me turn my nightmare into a happy ending. It can't have a happy ending because it's your nightmare. <laughs> All my nightmares are happy. Okay, so the prompt from last week was a witch loses her powers and is unable to get them back because this is Kristen's nightmare and that's what, that's what it be. Okay. The story is called Unbreakable Contract. The house was filled with the sounds of singing and dancing throughout the morning. Mother had all of the utensils in the house going at once to prepare us all for the day. The broom was sweeping, the ladle was stirring the pot, and the knives were cutting up the fruits and veggies. Everything was perfect, just like every morning was in our house. As I rushed towards the stairs, I chanted a small spell and gracefully leapt from the top landing, gently like a feather falling ever so carefully towards the bottom and landing on my tippy toes. Ten points! Perfect score! 
My mother clapped and cheered while watching my little performance, and I would do a light curtsy before running into the kitchen to help. While I helped my mother in the kitchen with the setup for breakfast before my father and little brother came down, we played around with different spells and cute tricks. My mother was a very well-known witch in our kingdom. There was a time when she used to work for the king himself as the advisor. But as she got older, she appointed someone else to replace her. Every day she would tell me all kinds of different stories of her adventures with the king and all of the amazing things she had seen. It's because of my mother being so amazing that one day I wish I could be just like her and advise the king with my great magical abilities. After breakfast, my mother would take me outside to go gather herbs in the forest nearby. She would explain all of the different uses each plant had and how they could be helpful to heal people or harmful and dangerous if mixed incorrectly. Sometimes we would encounter wild animals out there that wanted to make us their breakfast, but my mother, without even the slightest bit of hesitation or fear, would just wave her hand and whisper a chant, and the animals would calm down, then leave us alone. My mother was absolutely amazing, and there was nothing she couldn't do. As we were venturing through the forest, the sky started to become dark and cloudy, so it was probably going to rain. Suddenly, the clouds started turning dark red, and as I clasped onto my mom's sleeve, looking up to ask her what was happening, I could see a horrified look on her face. Just stay behind me and don't make any sound. Do you understand, Neria? She sternly said to me, in a tone I've never heard her use before. I was scared, and my eyes were watering, but I nodded. She began whispering, then tapped my forehead gently, and I could feel a wave of comfort washing over me, followed by a dim light barrier shielding me. The ground started to shake, and howls could be heard all around us, accompanied by the shrieking of bats. From the shadows in front of us emerged this tall, pale man with horns that twisted and coiled before poking forward. Ah, Lindell. You thought hiding in the forest would keep you safe. The man's voice echoed. It's such a pity you are no longer in your prime. Otherwise, you might have had a chance to get away. My mother began to have this strange aura around her, and horns slowly emerged from her head. Her hands were no longer soft and dainty, but had sharp, long claws, and her skin lost all of its warmth. Ha! You think showing your true form here and now you'll muster enough power to fight me? He laughed at my mother before lunging forward. Within an instant, she had summoned an orb of fire and launched it at him, exploding before he could get to her. I may not be in my prime anymore, but I never needed to be to handle you, brother. She jeered at him. She continued hurling flames out towards him, one after another, pushing him back and giving him no time to follow up. He began to back off, looking a bit irritated at how difficult this was for him. Wow. A whisper escaped my lips as I watched in awe of how amazing my mother was. His ears twitched and he smirked while looking at us. What is that you have hiding behind you, camouflaged? He inquired as his devilish grin grew wider. The ground began to shake more and he lifted his arm, causing the earth to raise spiked pillars towards my mother. I wonder if you can dodge them all. As he said that, pillars started rising from all directions around us, closing in. Swiftly, my mother kicked the barrier, causing me to land in some bushes not far off, but still remained camouflaged. The pillars closed in on her and pierced through her arms and legs. This is exactly why I'm doing this, sister. You are always soft and weak. You could have been so much more if you embraced your inner demon. But you went off to play with those humans and turned against your own kind. He walked over to her and the pillars slowly pulled out of her body. The large holes that the stones had stabbed through were leaking enormous amounts of blood. I didn't want to watch anymore, but I was frozen in terror and could only feel my entire face covered in tears as I gazed through the bushes. Well, we've waited long enough for this. He had a smug look on his face, but also seemed a bit bored with all of this. He raised his hand and thrusted it into my mother's chest, causing her to scream out in pain while also gasping. 
She wasn't able to speak anymore. Her body was too exhausted at this point. I felt all of the emotions in my body turn into anger. Everything inside of me was swirling and couldn't be contained. I shouted out and the barrier around me shattered, exposing my location, while also sending out a shockwave that pushed him back. I ran out from the bushes and held my mother's body. I felt warmth all over me from the blood leaking everywhere. She was trying to speak and reached up to pet my cheek. Go. Leave. Run. The man stepped forward and looked at me with a curious smile. So, this is what you are hiding. A pure-blooded witch. Where did you find this treasure? Did you plan on snacking on her later to regain your powers? He laughed, covering his face, almost with a look of pleasure. Then he grinned and kneeled down. Let's make a deal. I'll keep your mother alive and leave you alone in exchange for your magic? Without hesitation, I agreed. Please help her and then go away. Take whatever you want. Fix her. In the same second I shouted that out, I was being lifted into the air and could feel my body being drained until I felt empty. As my body fell to the ground, I felt heavy and sleepy, causing me to close my eyes and eventually pass out. I felt warm and cozy for some reason, even though I passed out in the middle of the forest. Opening my eyes, I was in bed, wrapped in my blanket and in my pajamas. Thank goodness it was all just a terrible nightmare. Rushing out of bed and heading to the staircase, I jumped down again and chanted my floating spell, but this time it didn't activate. As I fell down the stairs, crashing into the floor, I felt my body bruised all over. Neria! My mother shouted as she rushed over to pick me up. I don't understand. Why didn't the spell work? I mastered it. I weakly asked her as my body ached. The look on her face told me everything, that what had happened wasn't a dream and that I had given up my magic. My father rushed over to investigate the loud crashing sound and saw my body bruised. Ah, what happened? Did you fall down the stairs? Honey, what happened? He frantically questioned us both. My mother put me back in my bed and I could hear her explaining what had happened to us in the forest followed by my father shouting and banging things. I got out of my bed and slowly walked down the staircase. Papa, it isn't mother's fault. Her brother is a mean man and he did this. If I didn't give him my magic, he said he would kill her. I said with a blank look in my eyes. Her brother? He looked over at her with a menacing gaze. You just told me a demon came and attacked you both and stole her magic. My mother looked at me with sadness in her eyes. That's right. It was my brother. She nodded. My father's face looked disgusted and scared at the same time as he pieced that bit of information together. Shortly after, my mother said that she and I were going to take a little trip away to find a way to get my powers back. Dad never said goodbye to us, and we had packed almost all of our clothing, it seemed, for this journey, so I assumed we were going somewhere pretty far away. Hearing my mother tell me that we would be getting my magic back didn't bring me any joy for some reason. I felt empty and numb. Mom, without my magic, I can't become a royal advisor, right? I asked, looking up at her, and she nodded at me, with a tear sliding down her cheek. By the time it was night, we had made it to a large stone wall with a gate guarded by a group of knights. They bowed to my mother and let us in and a few of them began escorting us through the city towards a large castle in the distance. My mother stayed silent for most of the trip, which was probably due to something she and father had argued about. Eventually, we made it to the castle and we were invited into the throne room, where the queen was sitting there, alone, waiting. The knights left us, and it was just my mother, myself, and the queen. The queen was beautiful and regal-looking, we even had the same hair, and our eye color was similar. Your Grace, thank you for meeting me on such short notice. My mother bowed to the queen. Please, do not bow. I owe you so much, and we are close friends. She looked at me with a warm smile. What is your name, little one? I looked up at my mother, and then looked back at the queen. My name is Neria, your majesty. I bowed while introducing myself. Ah, Neria, 
It is a very beautiful name you picked for her, Lindell. My mother asked me to step outside while she spoke to the queen alone for a moment, so I complied and gave another curtsy before leaving. Through the door, I could hear parts of what they were discussing. How did this happen, Lindell? My only daughter, the firstborn child. You know that our bloodline's first witch is the strongest. I entrusted her to you so you could protect her and teach her how to use her magic on the same level as you, the queen said with a heavy sadness in her voice. What was she talking about? I apologize. I have no excuse for what happened, but I assure you she was raised with love and enough. Love does not rule a kingdom. You were never asked to love her. You were asked to train her and protect her. I'm sorry, Lindell, but we have to get her powers back, no matter the cost. The doors opened and my mother walked out and grabbed my hand, leading me down the hall with the knights by our side again. We entered a large room with a giant bed covered in silk. There was a fireplace and a table with chairs and a tea set. It was almost the size of our entire house. My mother crawled into bed silently and I laid next to her falling asleep almost immediately from the comfort of the bed. The sound of the door creaking open caused me to open my eyes and I noticed my mother had left. Climbing down from the bed, I snuck through the halls following the sounds of footsteps. As I got closer, I noticed that there were the sounds of metal jingling as well. We seemed to be walking for some time and ended up going down a spiraling staircase that led to a large chamber with strange markings drawn all over the floor. My mother had chains wrapped around her and was being escorted to the middle of a big circle on the floor. A group of robed figures stood around the circle and started chanting. The same dark energy that flowed around her before started swirling again and her horns came out. As the chanting got louder, she began to scream in agony and fell to the floor. Stop! What are you doing? I shouted as I entered the room. Everyone staring at me with wide eyes. Don't worry, dear. We are getting your magic back. The queen tried to reassure me that what they were doing was right. I gave up my magic to save my mother, and that's fine with me. You're hurting her. I tried to persuade them to stop. Don't worry, she may have served this kingdom well, but in truth, I am your mother, darling, and I'm ready to take you in now. As the queen was trying to dissuade me from stopping them, the chanting had gotten faster and harsher. The horns on mother's head were starting to disintegrate into embers, and her flesh was being burnt away as she faced me screaming, begging me to leave and look away. As I watched her turn into dust and ash, I felt that empty void inside of me fill back up again. However, it wasn't magical power. It was just sadness and hate. Tears started pouring down my cheeks again, and my eyes became filled with emotions instead of the glazed-over dull look I had carried since my magic was taken. In that moment, the shadows opened up and a gust knocked everyone over. The pale man stepped out and approached me. Look what they did to your poor mother. They thought if she was dead, I would have to return your powers, since I won't be keeping her alive anymore. But that's where they are wrong. Your mother's demonic healing ability already repaired her body shortly after I released her heart. Either way, come with me. You can get revenge for your poor mother. He offered his hand to me. You get away from her, the queen shouted as she and her robed followers all began chanting and a chilling hailstorm began forming in the room. With a simple swish of his wrist, the hailstorm was dispelled and half of the robed figures were engulfed in flames. Please, do you even understand the power I've recently obtained? As I looked at the queen and her people, then back at this man, I was filled with confusion. He technically didn't kill my mother and even promised to leave us be while these people who had claimed to be mother's friends betrayed her so easily, even after she worked so hard to advise this kingdom for many years. I took his hand and nodded to him that I was ready, and he pulled me into the shadows with him. Months went by, and he trained me in other arts that were non-magical, but very effective. The items he gave to me felt like they had their own special gifts within them, all marked with the same seal on it of his family. The hate that filled the void inside me had been polished and honed to its purest level. There was no more need for love and joy. 
only the thoughts of revenge against them all. My thoughts were no longer muddled by doing what was deemed right or wrong by society's standards, as my uncle taught me the way of his and my mother's people. Night after night, I would go out to villages as guided by my uncle to find witches. Each that I met, I had used these special tools on. They did not get a chance to scream in agony the way my mother did. They did not get a chance to beg the way she did. This is justice. As the tools entered their bodies, it would drain their energy the same way they tried to do to my mother, and the same way they would be turned to ash. Everything became so clear now, thanks to my uncle's guidance. Magic only brought about needless hopes and dreams that resulted in betrayal. A world without magic is clearly the world that we need to achieve true balance. As I snuck back into the castle where my life had blossomed anew, I exercised my new techniques on those remaining roped figures, one by one from the shadows. Finally, heading to the queen's chambers, I watched her rest in her bed for a moment, but did not want her to get out so easily after what she had done. I signaled for my uncle who had pulled me and the queen into the shadows. The moment we pulled her through, her eyes opened and she began screaming, but it was too late. She was already in our realm. For the next few days, I tried using as many of the tools as possible on her that would drain every last drop of her essence until she finally lost her strength to resist and turn to ash. The symbols on the tools would glow after every use on every witch. My uncle approached me from behind and placed his hand on my shoulder. Good girl, you keep feeding me such invigorating snacks. Every night I set out finding more villages with witches, continuing to do as I was taught. This was no longer just revenge for my mother. This is justice. Yeah. Oh my god! I like it. I like that she gave up her powers to save her mother's life. And then... And, and that didn't... Uh, that didn't work out. <laughs> and then it's just like, she burnt to ash, and Michelle immediately starts laughing. <laughs> I did. Shut up, you shut up. As I watched her turn into dust... <laughs> That's not funny. That's not funny, okay. Yeah, man. I mean, like, because she, like, her mom just couldn't get a break. <laughs> she just, she had a whole, like, just tumped into her. Her husband apparently abandoned her. And the queen's like, let me just turn you into ash. And, and yeah. Yeah, she just couldn't get a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make sure that everyone, like, understood that, like, the mom is still powerful. She's still very powerful. She could have done all that regardless. But... Because she took Naria with her, she couldn't properly protect herself. She could have totally handled her brother. She could have murdered him. Ah, uh, yeah, she was. She had the upper hand too until he like tried to use her, um, uh, Naria as bait. Exactly, and that's why it's like, hey, stay behind me and don't make any sounds. It's like, wow, you made a sound. <laughs> wow, mother. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's just like. You know, um, I was trying to hint as much as possible, like when he said, like, oh, you found a pure-blooded witch, were you going to snack on her? That was supposed to be the first hint that Neria is not her daughter. Yeah. And also a hint, like it's foreshadowing towards the, near the end, where his symbols would grow, like glow every single time she would use the tools, because he's just absorbing all the witch's powers through Neria killing them. So not only does he have Neria's powers, which is like a pure-blooded lineage witch thing, but also has all these other people that she's murdering. Yeah, and I like how uh, even when she just gave up her powers to like save her mother, she was like, I wasn't like super sad about losing my powers. And then um, in the end, it was like, you know, they're like, oh, don't worry, we'll get your, we'll get your powers back, we'll get your powers back, and. <laughs> They killed her mother, and she's like, I don't, this is, firstly, it didn't work, and secondly, you've now killed my mother. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, therefore. <laughs> that's the thing, like, for me, magic inside of any of these magical beings, when you remove the magic from them, it takes away who they are, what they are, it takes away their existence, basically. So that's why her eyes grew dull, 
she didn't feel like when she fell down the stairs she wasn't crying she wasn't like you know whatever she's just my body aches that's all you know she feels nothing she's numb like she's just like whatever it's like mom i can't do magic no more all right you're gonna get my magic back that's why she felt nothing exactly and then in that moment when her mother was murdered it was big enough that the empty void of lost magic was filled with just rage yeah so it's like okay i don't have magic anymore but i hate you yeah so it's kind of like instead of having the magic she just filled herself with darkness yeah that was that was messed up it was but the queen's just like look it's not like she's your real mom anyways who cares i'm your real mother let me take care of you now that you've lost your magic and are useless. There's some more, like, story material and lore <laughs> woven into that uh, for everybody here. I hope you all enjoyed that story, though. And I also hope that me and my COVID voice isn't messing with anybody. I don't know if I sound the same or if I sound different or if I sound, like, do I sound sick? Who yeah, knows? Yeah, you sound a little sick. Yeah. So, yeah, so we can, like, keep it short this time around. This time around. Yeah, we don't want we don't want to hurt your voice. Yeah. So with that, do you have a prompt for me for the next week? That is a very good question. So what's your prompt for me? Nice. Okay, so... Your prompt is that you are the gatekeeper to the afterlife. You are basically guarding, like, one door is for heaven, one is for hell, and one is an unknown door that no one knows what it does. But suddenly your replacement shows up, and now it's your turn to pick a door. But the idea is that a gatekeeper is being relieved of their duty and has to now pick a gate. It has to pick a gate. Interesting. All right, so your prompt is, hold on a second. So your prompt is that you are you wake up on an island that's surrounded by a sea of clouds with nothing but the clothes on your back and a fairy. That's kind of like, I mean, it's a fairy. You said like a fairy? Like a fairy? Like a fairy. Okay, so I'm gonna just leave the island. <laughs> like, no, 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 a fairy, a fairy, like a uh, not not a boat. Yeah, no, like the magical creature that can just <laughs> use magic. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's fine. You're not supposed to be trapped on an island. You just wake up there. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, you get, you're waking up. You get your own fairy, and now we're the fairly odd parents. And it's like, well. Well, do you want a boat instead? You want a fairy boat? <laughs> What if it's both? You want both a fairy and a fairy? <laughs> My fairy turns into a fairy. <laughs> okay, so um, you got like a... Um, you have a fairy that's like the king of red lions that can turn into a boat. Okay, cool. I got a fairy fairy. Yes. All right, so my story is done. Would you guys like to hear my new story? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Once upon a time, I got up and then I left. <laughs> <laughs> and then I took the ring to Mordor. <laughs> Once a time I was like, oh, that's interesting. Let me leave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. So, if you guys have any prompts for us, again, you can go to fabulousduo.podbean.com and hit up our contact us page. So, yeah, give us ideas, give us feedback, give us anything you want. Give us Open likes. up. Open up an interesting conversation with us. And yeah, so the, oh, here. Um, let me also pitch this idea. So this was something I was talking about with Kristen earlier. Uh, an idea for like a special or a live or something like that. Where um, we would give a couple people, not like everybody, but like a few people access to like a live Google Doc. And then just have them write a story live and we would read it. Or we would do that with each other. And it'll just be funny stuff and... Um, yeah, just if anyone has opinions on what they think of that or how that might be fun or whatever, 
let us know. Reach out to us in the contact us section. And yeah, it'd be cool if we do something like that. That's just uh, just just a thought for now. Maybe we'll do a poll or something about it later. But yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we hope to hear from you guys soon. Um, we will see you all next week. Bye. Oh, don't mm-hmm. forget to like follow our stuff on Spotify and. Uh... Yeah, you can follow us again on like Google Podcasts, Spotify. Um, you can hit up our Twitter. You can. We have a Twitter. Just, we have a Twitter. Oh damn. Yeah. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Did you hear my do you hear my fridge? Yeah. You fridge. You you, you have no respect. <laughs> anyway. Her hands were no longer soft and dainty, but had sh- long but had long sharp claws. But had schlong. <laughs> Did I say schlong? <laughs>